You are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. You've heard about bulbs and tubers, but have you tried corms? Corms with an M, not not corn. Corms are the storage organ you've never heard of and the sponsor of this episode of Rootbound. Corms. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Rootbound. I'm your host, and my name is Steve. Rootbound is the podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. Each episode, I invite a guest who tells me about a plant that's meaningful to them, and then I tell the guest about a plant that's meaningful to me. And through this process, we can all learn more about plants and learn more about each other. Now, before we meet our guest today, I have one word for you. Shrub. Both uh, plants on this episode today are shrubs, and that had me thinking about shrubs and really, what is the definition of a shrub? And also, is there any difference between a shrub and a bush? Uh, Spoiler alert, not really. Um, I was looking into both of these words, and just to kind of like give the basics, a shrub is kind of a more botanical definition for a plant, and it is a plant that has a woody stem but it is shorter and often has multiple stems unlike a tree. So a tree is woody, but it has one main stem and it gets really tall. Whereas a shrub has multiple main stems and it doesn't get too tall. That's kind of the definition. And and bush is basically the same thing. I read one example that that said that maybe originally a shrub meant what I said, a woody plant with multiple stems that doesn't get very tall. And a bush more described the shape of a plant, like a sh- a plant that takes the shape of a bush. But that's not really clear to me. It really kind of seems they're just synonyms for the most part. And maybe bush is a little bit more colloquial. There is some evidence of that in the etymology. So a uh, shrub probably comes from a Scandinavian origin that essentially means what I said, a woody plant that doesn't get too big um, with multiple stems. Whereas uh, bush comes from German, there is a German word, bush, which is S-C-H instead of just S-H. And that seems to come from the same Latin root that gives us the words bosco in Italian, or bosque in Spanish, or bois in French. And all of those words mean forest or woods. And, you know, the word bush can also mean an area, you know, go out into the bush in a wild area like a forest. So maybe that word bush got put onto the singular plant a little bit later in English. I'm not too clear about that. One last little fun uh, bush fact that I learned on Wikipedia is that a small bush is sometimes botanically called a subshrub. Oh, Knights of Nee, we have brought you your shrubbery. May we go now? Hi, Michael. Welcome to Rootbound. Thanks. It's great to be here. Do you have a plant to share with us today? I have so many plans to share with anybody who ever asks, so <laughs> I'm happy you asked me. Um, and Unfortun- it's be- oh. oh, yeah. I was going to say, unfortunately, we have to stick to one, but I know that you have like lots in your back pocket. Uh, sure. Yeah. No, I can stick to one. My plant is autumn olive, Eliagnus umbellata. Very interesting. I This is one that, you know, I, I've, I've listened to your podcast uh, a little bit, and this is one of the names that's popped up that I really feel like I have no clue what this is. <laughs> um, and so I'm very excited to hear from you. Autumn Olive. So Olive of the Fall. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's kind of a, a lot of people can sometimes mistake it for Russian olive or uh, a couple other plants. Um, I I've also like to call it sparkleberry, um, mm. which is a lot more indicative of how the berry itself looks. That's a great name. Yeah. It's got these like little silver sparkles on the berry. Um, and but it's also referred to as autumn olive because of the time of the year that you can collect it, which is in the fall. And what about the olive part? Or is it olive-like? Um, so I believe it's probably referred to as olive because of the pit that's inside of it. So it does have kind of an olive-shaped pit, but it is in no way related to the olive family or the olive plants. Um, and it doesn't taste like an olive either. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. I, I always <laughs> love like plant names are always can be so confusing sometimes because they're like... Who came up with this and uh, why did they decide to call it this? And then we're kind of maybe stuck with it. But so maybe Sparkleberry is a good way to go. 
loved. Yeah, I'm a hate love in a hate love relationship with common names, and uh, I, I like to switch it up a little bit. And Sparkleberry is a really fun one. So yeah, tell me more about this plant. I literally have no idea about it. Where does it grow? What's its deal? Uh, yeah. So it's native to Asia and Europe, but it is classified invasive in North America, and it grows in a shrubbery pattern um, with a lot of suckers coming out from the same areas. And the reason it's problematic, as invasive species tend to be, is because of how prolifically it fruits and how easy it is for those seeds to be spread and how advantageous North America's climate is for this specific plant. So it's just doing what a plant does whenever it's in an area. You know, it just tries to live. It's just living its life. But unfortunately, it does have negative connotations and a negative impact based on how much uh, it's how much room it's taking up for other native plants that um, actually host a lot more insects and animals. There are lots of animals that are learning to eat autumn olive because that can be an issue with invasive species is Mm. that there's there's no native predators or anything to eat it. Um, But that is part of the problem is it is so delicious that wildlife has quickly learned to eat it and it does spread pretty quickly. So it's mostly found. um, I think it is found all across North America. Um, It can be kind of sparse in some areas. I know. um, And actually, in where I live in the Chicago area. They actually do a pretty good job of maintaining invasive species, at least as far as uh, autumn olive is concerned in the forest preserves and natural areas. But there are a few places where I can go um, within just like with less than an hour's drive of where I live and be able to harvest quite a lot of these berries. Um, and they provide a multitude of nutrients in the plant as a whole provides a lot of really cool and interesting uses. Interesting. I think maybe maybe before we get into those, because I'm very curious about the uses, um, and maybe you've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious maybe specifically why this plant is meaningful to you, and maybe it has to do with its uses, but I, I would like to hear a little bit about that. Um, it's meaningful to me because of uh, how delicious it is. It's probably my favorite plant. Um, you feel like you're doing an ecological service by collecting as much of it as you possibly can, mm-hmm. so I'm allowed to lean into my gluttony a little bit, which is always fun. Um, I'm very food motivated, so if it's something that I can um, collect a lot of, get in an abundance, and then is also delicious, provides a lot of excellent nutrients, and is easily preservable for a long term in a multitude of ways. So you can use it in a variety of ways. The seed is non-toxic. It's not necessarily comfortable to eat when it's fresh, but um, if you dry it, you can, you know, it's, we'll get to uses later, but um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, just a really beautiful plant to me, too. Um, It's not necessarily the most significant plant in my life, but it is one of my absolute favorites that I look forward to um, seeing again and again every single year because of how much it provides for me. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that, you know, I've talked about a lot on the podcast. Um, There's always this dichotomy a bit with invasive plants and like enjoying a plant for what it is, but also like understanding potentially its role in in the environment and how do you like balance that and i think you 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 said something earlier about how it's doing what it does but and that's unfortunate like you know the plant has no malice as an invasive species right it's doing what it's doing but that balance is interesting um of 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 reconciling uh your relationship with the plant yeah you don't want to have too much hate in your heart for anything at all especially when it comes to pretty much non-feeling things like plants you know we should find the silver linings and the ways we can find love and experience um a little bit of uh harm reduction through that that well said um, so yeah, let, let's talk about the uses. Um, I, maybe we'll start with edible uses. Uh, the audience may not know, but you host a podcast called Wild Edible World. So I think the edible part is uh, is uh, pretty uh, key to get into. Yeah, how, how do we eat this plant? Yeah, huge emphasis in my life, uh, the edible part for sure. I, uh, I enjoy it fresh a lot. So I'm not refraining from stuffing my face with it while I'm out collecting it. It's delicious, fresh. It's really tangy. It's uh, whenever it's early in in the season, it's a little bit astringent. Um, and as a forager, I've come a little bit, become um, probably more accustomed to astringent flavors than a typical grocery store American consumer. But um, I think it's a really enjoyable thing. You know, I think people, um, 
it's just a little bit more of an emphasis on that feeling when you get when you drink like a really dry wine or something or mm. you know it's just like mm-hmm. tannic kind of drawing the moisture out of your mouth but it's just being being a little bit punchier about it um and i can i enjoy that and the same thing with a couple other wild fruits that provide that um and i think that in and of itself that like bitterness you know there's a basic nutrition to the flavor qualities of uh mild bitterness that are actually essential for our health but i digress other ways we can use this wonderful berry um i like drying it whole Um, one of my Mm. favorite ways to do it is just like gather a bunch of it dry it whole and then um you can grind it up into a flour and Mm. add it to um small pastries or like different like your banana breads and stuff like that to give it like a nice like really kind of sour almost cherry taste and the Mm. seed just kind of disappears it doesn't provide any like bitterness or excuse me even like almond flavors like some seeds or pits can tend to do it doesn't have any of those nutrients so it it really almost kind of builds into the flour a little bit so and the seed like uh it it grinds up easily too and some seeds you get and they kind of like are pretty hard and hard to like deal with but it yeah so the only reason that it's not comfortable to eat the seed while it's fresh is because it is um kind of fibrous so Mm. it's not easy to break through it it's not hard it's just kind of uh it it's just chewy i guess um so it, the best what i typically do i mean if you are to eat the plant at the tr- at the plant source and you're eating the berries uh if you're going to spit the seeds out spit it out at the base of the plant so that you're making sure that you're con- controlling the spread as much as possible while still enjoying the plant and prevent preventing it from going everywhere. Um, Great point. I was going to ask you about that. Like you can easily like kind of chew the seed out as you're eating it like you can with other things. Sure. Yeah. The pulp separates pretty easily. It's a pretty juicy fruit. That's the fun Mm. thing about it is that it's it's um, the ratio of fruit to seed can vary from shrub to shrub. Um, But fortunately, you're where you find one, you're going to find probably seven or eight or 20 more. And uh, they're all going to have different sizes and stages in their ripeness. Hmm. Interesting. I'm, I'm just looking at some pictures now because I had to like visualize it because I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen it before. There are these just beautiful little red berries. Like the olive name is completely like, <laughs> like a misnomer. They look more like little cherries or currants or something like that. Yeah, I think the misnomer also, um, I'm thinking back a little bit and I think it comes to, to do with the shape of the leaves that the, yes, the shape of the leaves that. looks sort of olive I see that. I see that. Yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, they, they're beautiful little beautiful little berries. Um, yeah, cool. the the shrub the shrub entirely is beautiful. Um, they yeah, so it's a bright red berry with these silver sparkles. The bark itself is almost got these like silver uh, spots on it, and then the leaves themselves um, are a, a really uh, matte green on top. And then whenever you flip the leaf over, it's a uh, silver, like it's metallic oh, wow. silver. It's shiny. Wow. Um, and the flowers are almost kind of metallic yellow, and they smell incredible. Um, and they're 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 a really interesting shape too, almost like a polygonal bell shape. Hmm. If wow. you if you want to look up a picture of that, yeah, I'm seeing that too. Yeah, wow, that's so cool. I I you know I guess I probably have seen this, but maybe I didn't pay attention. Um, I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna start looking for this uh, mm-hmm. next season and, and see what I can find. I'm down in, in Northern Virginia, so I'm sure it's it's down here too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's certainly ubiquitous. Uh, and just to cover another thing uh, that I like to make sure that we verify on on the show that I, I host that um, it can sometimes be mistaken with a plant called honeysuckle, mm-hmm. um, which which is another really uh thorough invasive we um, just covered that on the last episode actually we were talking about that and yeah. yes it's and, and you're right I, I i think i can tell the difference particularly with the way the berries line up against each other um yep maybe you can explain that a little bit better than me my vocabulary is not very good about that but yes i think you're saying you want to be sure because the honeysuckle is poisonous right yeah and they do yeah. um become red at around the same time the honeysuckle will stick around for quite a long uh quite a bit longer because um the only thing that really vegetize them are like deer not too many birds um mm-hmm. but the autumn olive everything finds it delicious um but the main difference is is where the berries lay honeysuckle is going to be sitting on top of the leaves um, connected directly to the branch, whereas mm-hmm. autumn olive is going to be hanging droop like from a stem underneath the leaves. So pretty easy distinction there, as well as the sparkling pattern um, on the berry, which is not present on honeysuckle at all. That seems like a hard thing to like 
get across in a photograph. I'm looking at pictures of these berries. Um, and the sparkle, I think, seems like something you got to see in person, huh? It is. Yeah. So, yeah, it looks just kind of like gray spots and photos. But um, de- and depending on the shrub that you yeah. find, they have different densities of spots. And sometimes they're a little bit lighter, sometimes they're shinier, sometimes it's almost all spots. Sometimes you're only just like, oh, there's a spot and like only one or two on this fruit. Mm. It's it can be really diverse, Very but there's always some. Um, okay, I think we're still talking about eating it. You've you've got it fresh. You've got it <laughs> dried. Are we missing anything? Um, let's see. Fresh, dried. You can easily make fruit leather. So I oh, do. I really. Yeah. Enjoy, it's probably my favorite fruit leather. It tastes a lot like uh, almost like a sour cherry fruit of the ro- uh, fruit roll up. Um, and that's how I usually kind of like form it. You know, you make a big pulp. You get a um, what's that called? A, a food mill. Mm-hmm. to make things a little bit easier i guess mm-hmm. i've done it by hand as well with just a um a colander and a spatula and mm-hmm. you're just mashing the fruit mm-hmm. through there all you got to do is just separate the fruit from the seed and that's mostly just for um edibility purpose again mm-hmm. once they're like dried they're still kind of chewy ground up from like a blade with velocity it's gonna powderize it enough to be very consumable but dried in a paste it's just not that great and um yeah it's Stuff, that's probably my favorite way to enjoy it. And then what I've done with the seeds afterwards that are left behind that still have a little bit of residual pulp and skin is that you dump that in a pot of water with um, the appropriate amount of sugar and water and just make a simple syrup with the residue. Oh, wow, And that'll cool. just give you just like, you know, a little bit to use the rest of that. And that also, um, if it's hot enough, it'll boil the seeds and denature them. And that way you can throw them away safely. That's great. I love I love those techniques where you can kind of use the remnants of stuff, right, and use every little less. But that's a great technique. I think I'm going to try maybe with some even some other plants. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, we've talked about edibility. Are, you mentioned other uses, though. Are there other uses for this plant? Sure. Yeah, the wood is actually really good for weaving. So because it mm. grows in a sucker style, it shoots up a lot of. Um, sprouts that grow really quick from the same base Um, so because this is an invasive plant and we want to get it out of our environments and our ecologies as much as possible cutting down these um, you know suckers and cutting down the base plant as well with also lots of fast growing edge growth um, is a good alternative to willows native willows which are also a sustainable source of weaving but um, this is you know one step further (laughs) mm-hmm Very interesting. Very interesting. And I can't recall too too well, but I'm pretty sure the the wood is good for other like um, you know it's I would use it for a fishing rod as well. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure how well it would be used for um, bowmanship, but I imagine pretty decent. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, are we missing any other fun facts or dazzling details about the autumn olive? Well, the uh, flowers, like I mentioned smell wonderful so if you create an enflorage just like lay down a layer of fat and just pile as many flowers as you can get which will also help prevent fruit setting in the future so if you're you know if that's more your style and you're not necessarily a food forager but um you can create a really simple perfume with a bunch of coconut fat and just lay down a layer of it and then one by one set each flower on top of it and after um, a certain amount of weeks the uh, aromatics set into the fats and then you have basically like a um, a perfume balm wow oh nice that's really cool i mean could you do anything else with the flowers could you like do a tea with it or steep it in any other i believe thing like yeah that? the teas it's good for a tea as well um could, mostly just for the aromatics it really doesn't provide that much as far as taste but it, um, they're non-toxic so uh, very fascinating I'm always talking about on my podcast about making mead. I'm a beekeeper and I, I make a lot of different uh, infused meads. Sure. And I've been experimenting this year with putting flowers in the mead as it ferments. So I did one with milkweed flowers. I did one with uh, um, that's what that mimosa is. flowers. Oh, nice. <laughs> that's milkweed oh. flower. <laughs> Wonder- yeah, it look, looks, looks beautiful. Yeah, it's such a beautiful pink color. Uh, I haven't drank mine crazy. this year yet. I only have one small bottle of it. Uh, but I, I do like single batches. Um uh, but yeah, I, maybe next year I'll try to do some uh, autumn olive uh, mead. That could be cool and get some of those aromatics in there. Definitely. Yeah, it's really perfumey. So it's not like necessarily a fruity smell, but it is. It's pretty very like, I don't know, perfumey to be verbose. To be our sparkle, yeah. 
To me, I was sparkle, yeah. Louise, you're my sparkle, yeah. To me, I was sparkle. Well, uh, thank you for sharing about Autumn Olive. Do you mind if I share a plant with you? I'd love to hear it. All right, so this week, I'm a little bit cheating because I know you're probably going to have lots to say about this plant, and, and my kind of like, the reason why this plant is meaningful to me is relatively new. I, I've been using this plant for a, few, for a few years, but it is a plant that is definitely on my list of plants that you know I interact with a lot. Um, but I also knew that you probably have even more to say about this plant than me. Um, and I'll just get right to it. The plant is, is spice bush, Lindera <sighs> benzoin. Um, which, which, you know, the reason why it's meaningful to me, I learned about it a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a guy in DC who does these foraging walks. I've been going on to learn about this stuff. And he, he showed me this plant and it was, it was one of those plants. I'm like, why didn't I know about this plant? It's so beautiful. It smells so good. And it has such an awesome taste. And it's like, you go to the store and you pay all this money for all spice. And there's a thing that is just so abundant and native that, that can really serve that same purpose. Um, so that's, that's. I was like, why don't, I mean, and it grows so, so prolifically around here. And most people have never even heard of it. And it's just so interesting about that of like how, how, like just the way that society has this value, certain things over other things. Um, Seriously. Yeah. Curious to me. Yeah. Appalachian so, allspice. Yes. <laughs> that's a good name for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just for the audience, I didn't do this on purpose, actually. I didn't actually look up autumn olive at all, but we're talking about another shrub with beautiful red berries. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, so they're, they're, they go, they look, they will look quite nice together. I, do they grow in similar areas? Do you see them near each other? No, I find most spice bush in canopy, um, whereas mm -hmm. uh, um, autumn olive is usually taking up space. Uh, it's advantageous, so it's in disturbed areas. And also mm -hmm. where I find it personally is out in prairies, where it can really rise up above everything else that's growing around it really quickly. I see. Yeah, that 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 does make sense. That's my experience with with spice bush. It really is kind of an understory thing hanging out there, really in the forest. That's cool. Um, one thing that really stands out to me about spice bush, well, the three the three kind of main parts is when the flowers are beautiful. These little red oval berries. Uh, they have a single seed in them. They are uh, they are botanically droops. It's a recurring theme on the show. It's a it's a fun word. Uh, Love a good droop, man. Indeed. All my favorite things are droops. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yeah that, i'm a droop a great, i'm a droop guy yeah yeah I'm, <laughs> i love that me too um <laughs> then the the flowers are also really beautiful these beautiful yellow flowers that look kind of like i don't know they almost they look a little bit like like witch hazel but they're like in the in the spring and not in the fall but they're maybe not quite but they're these little like spindly yellow flowers that are in these clusters bright yellow yes yeah. mega clusters too i mean yeah. you're, they're they're gonna be so obvious in the spring because they're just covered in flowers they're yeah. beautiful and then and then the bark is this beautiful gray kind of silver gray once you mm -hmm. once you know what it looks like you can always be like oh that spice bush because it, it really kind of stands out amongst other plants like it on the forest floor yeah, it's very individualistic in a number of ways as well. I think the leaves um, stand out as well. They're kind of longer True. and more oval. They're kind of like fatter than most like leaves. They they look kind of in between buck, Ohio Buckeye and pawpaw leaves. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, I'm always kind of looking for those shapes anyway. So it's like they, they kind uh, of look like small pawpaw leaves. Yeah. But in like slightly bigger clusters. That's true. Yeah. And they, they kind of grow in the same areas together. Um, the pop Agreed. And the spice bush. Um, and they so, go perfectly together. I have jam like a foot away from me that is papa spice bush, spice wow. bush jam. <laughs> that is a great idea. I'm going to do that next year. I'd never, I've never. They're amazing. I'm always kind of like a, like when it's papa season, I really kind of just focus on them and only have them by themselves, but I should mm -hmm. mix it up. That's, that's a great idea. Um, a couple fun facts that you may or may not know about spice bush. One that that uh, binomial scientific name, Lindera benzoin. I was trying to learn what that means. Lindera is because there's a Swedish botanist named John Linder who is named after. It might have been Johan Linder. Um, so you know, just some, but probably Carl Linnaeus named it after him. It's like so funny. These like European guys name name uh, American plants after themselves. <laughs> and then benzoin. This is this is from. Um, this is from uh, the Butler Soil Water Conservation District. I don't know what county that is in. It just has a very nice article about spice bush I found on. But it says that benzoin is an old Arabic 
uh, word for a species of Styrax plant, um, which from which benzoic acid is obtained. Uh, a spice bush does not contain benzoic acid, but apparently the smell is quite similar. And benzoic acid or benzoin is like this resin. It's kind of like frankincense. It's like a resiny stuff that has a nice smell and is used in perfume making and I think maybe in food stuff. So it's called Lindera benzoin because of this guy, John Linder, and because it kind of smells like this plant that is from the old world that makes this thing. But it does not actually have benzoic acid in it at all. It's just a similar smell. So right on. I did not know that. Yeah, so that's that's kind of interesting. Um, and then the the other ones that you that you probably do know these, but I, I was reading that I've never used the green berries, but apparently the green berries also make a nice pepper substitute. So the red berries for for the audience, uh, how I do the red berries is I squeeze out the seed and then I dry them, and then I use them as a like allspice substitute. So I put them in in uh, mulled wine or in like breads or whatever, anything that has a has a Use for allspice. I don't know. How do you use the berries? Um, you know, thinking about it, that's probably the safest way to use them. I use the whole berry, seed and all. I dehydrate them. And then whenever I, I mean, I try to keep them um, with a desiccant packet. I have like a whole bunch of, you know, a drying process. Um, but I keep them as dry as possibly be, as possible because the seed does contain a abnormal amount of fats. Um, for seeds. So um, oh. it's really good for you, but that does make it potentially slightly shelf unstable, no matter how ah. much you dry it. So the best advice is if you're going to keep it whole, which I enjoy using it whole, I don't see any reason to nix the seed um, mm-hmm. because I think it provides um, just a little more flavor. Um, and whenever I, sometimes I can't collect that much spice bush, so I need every little ounce of flavor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you want to stick it in the freezer after you dehydrate it. So fully dry it and then keep it in the freezer. And that'll make sure that it never goes rancid. Um, I personally haven't done that. I just know that that's the best pra- practice. I've never had yeah. any go rancid. But if I'm going to give somebody the best advice, it's not necessarily the thing I have followed. But <laughs> it's what it's, if you're Good. sure and best practice spice yeah. bushes. Yeah. If it's that valuable to you, you want to be dang sure. So stick it in the freezer. That makes sense. So you just grind the whole thing up, seed and all, and this because the seed's pretty hard on the spice bush. But you just like mortar it, and pestle it, it or no? A spice grinder works just fine, or a coffee grinder. It it blends up. Okay, that's good. Um, that's cool. So then the main the main way I use it, I'm sure you'll you have this experience too, is making tea from it from the from the from the twigs. And oh uh, sure, this yeah. Is, this is a really lovely tea you and and this is you know from for a lot of people I think this is a little bit unfamiliar I talked about this a little bit in our sassafras episode too uh, it's a kind of tea that you have to take the 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 twigs material or like small bark small pieces of wood and then you need to boil it for a long time it's not something you can just steep right and get enough flavor like you need to let it boil for like I, I don't know I was told and I've always done about 10 minutes um, of boiling. And mm-hmm. I, I cut the stems up into small pieces so you have as much surface area on the little twigs as possible. Mm-hmm. And it just makes a very lovely tea. I don't know how to describe the the, the flavor. It's very like, I don't know, like like uh, spicy. Like, I don't know. Yeah, like, it's, al- it's almost got like a, a mentholiness to it, but not, uh, also like anise-y, licorice-y. Um, I don't it's know. It's a the, very the- like fall seasonings flavor. Yeah, right? I mean, they call it allspice for a reason. Yeah, yeah. And, and it makes a great tea. I add, I'm a beekeeper, so add some honey in there. <laughs> great, great uh, uh, tea. And then I, I've done it with maple syrup as well. Um, and in fact, with with I, I have a maple tree in my backyard, and so I have a silver maple. And so every year I make I make about eight ounces of syrup. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> a whole but like I, what a whole month of work. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> one whole day of boiling down, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, but uh, collecting it for a couple of weeks. But um, I've done that with my maple syrup, but also some other people maple syrup. It's a great, it's a great tea. And it's a tea that you can like just you know get out in your on your hike. I mm-hmm. think I think the main difference to, to talk about these two plants we're talking about today though is you need to be a bit more respectful of your harvesting <laughs> of spice bush, right? You don't want to take all those berries. Uh, because it's a native plant, you want it to spread. And then also, if you're harvesting the the actual wood, right, the twigs for your tea, you don't want to, like, damage the plant too much. I don't know if you have any best practices. Um, I'm kind of a beginner at this. Uh, how do you how do you approach harvesting spice bush? 
So you're definitely on the right track there. You don't want to collect everything. It is a really, really important host plant for a a very diverse amount of moths. And um, it's a very popular fall forage for deer and rabbits. And I mean, I mean, I could go on and on. Every animal in the woods loves this plant and needs it Mm -hmm. to survive. So we can enjoy it while also, um, you know, being respectful and mindful and harvesting the appropriate amount. So that's usually not taking every single berry you see using, um, you know, amount of discernation of leaving some behind. Um, as far as bark is concerned, you don't typically want to use any live bark, um, things that have fallen or, um, you know, you can grab a live branch. They are also, you know, not going to die if you take one twig from 20 different uh, little bushes. I have a forest that I go to where it is literally spice bush as far as the eye can see mm-hmm, for about mm-hmm. a, a couple miles. It's a really beautiful place. Oh, wow. Um, wow. But. Um, alternatively, you can also use the leaves um, as a spice and uh, as a tea um, beverage. So they also oh, wow. have if you break the leaf, you can smell that it smells exactly like the rest of the plant and mm-hmm, it is mm-hmm. just as usable. Oh, wow. I have to do that more. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I was told that maybe the leaves don't impart as much flavor, but maybe you just need a bit more in your tea to make it work. Absolutely not as much, but it's still there. So, yeah, compensate as appropriately and it probably I, I i wonder if like you probably couldn't dry the leaves you probably lose the flavor pretty quick i haven't you tried probably, it. yeah i wonder i wonder if you have to use it more fresh but even that's not a problem you can use it use it fresh interesting yeah um yeah and you're mentioning about the the insects that are uh, you know rely on this plant the one that i i i read about but i've never seen but we'll be looking out next time i'm around a lot of spice bushes the spice bush swallowtail butterfly there's a specific yeah. spice bush butterfly which is very cool and it's gorgeous i saw some pictures of it yeah i need a i've never seen one on purpose so it looks really beautiful Me either. Yeah, yeah but i've seen the pictures i'm always it's it's like that with with uh with papa i'm always looking for that zebra swallow t- zebra swallowtail and i've never seen one uh uh in person and these uh you know these uh butterflies that are very specific to very specific plants are so cool and i'm always wanting to see them but i've, I've not had a lot of luck yeah me either man uh, you really got to look for them i think i read something about the uh you know a lot of times the caterpillars will um hide out uh on the ground at the base of the tree during the day and then come up during the twilight um, to feed. That makes sense. So uh, a little hint there for your caterpillar searching. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, yeah, I have to do some more research about when those caterpillars are most active and, and when that's, that's happening. That's yeah. Any really cool. Um, And maybe just the one last thing uh, before, you know, we, we, we wrap up. If you, you know, audience, if you look up spice bush, you learn how to identify it. That gray bark we mentioned, the berries are very clear if it's berry time. The yellow flowers are pretty clear if it's flower time. But the one, what, what I love about this plant is the easy way to know it's spice bush. If you just go up and just scratch the, the bark, like a scratch and stiff snicker. Seriously. Sticker, yeah. It smells like spice bush. And you're like, oh, once you smell it once, it's unmistakable. And you're going to be addicted too. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. So yeah, I. I audience, I recommend uh, getting out there and trying some spice bush uh, if you can. Do you have any other like things about spice bush? Like I said, I've I've just been exploring it maybe the last few years. I feel like I'm pretty new to it. Uh, what did I miss anything about spice bush? Anything I should know about it? Um, I think it's pretty. Rem- I mean, I, you didn't necessarily miss anything, but I just want to add that I think it's pretty remarkable in fall as well. The big yellow, the, these big round leaves turn yellow pretty early, so oh. they're also really striking when the, the uh, berries are ready so it's I don't know I like the yellow colors of fall and everything so it's one of the first ones that kind of like you're gonna if where I go there's just like this ocean of yellow and it's um you know gorgeous so it's like walking through a sunset so it's a beautiful plant um it needs to be respected and collected with mindfulness um because of how many other plants or animals find it as beautiful as we do so yeah that's that's all I'd add well said uh and thanks for joining Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's been great chatting. Okay, before we wrap up today, one last little fun etymological fact concerning the word shrub. If you remember back on the episode when I talked to my friend Jewel about fennel and juneberry, she mentioned I should make a shrub from juneberries, and I think I even mentioned that I made a shrub from 
the wine berries that I mentioned in that episode. Um, and a shrub is, uh, is a, a drink that is made out of vinegar, sugar, and often some kind of fruit or other kind of flavoring. And it's often used as kind of a component in cocktails. It is in itself non-alcoholic, but it adds flavor to cocktails. But you can also like add it to soda water and just make it kind of a nice kind of lemonade or, you know, tangy beverage like a lemonade or something. But it's, you know, made with vinegar, fruit, and sugar. Um, And it's called a shrub, spelled exactly the same way. And so I was curious, what is the etymological connection between the bush shrub and the drink shrub? And it turns out there is none, apparently. Uh, it is a, one of those things where two words, two words have the same spelling and completely different etymological origins. Um, from my understanding, from reading online, the, the drink shrub comes from an Arabic word, which I'm not sure if this is exact. It's either sha'arab or maybe there's one that's mashrub. Arabic speakers get at me, but I'm pretty sure there's an Arabic word that means drink. Um, or something related to drink that they suspect that the, the English version of the word shrub comes from. And I think kind of the first documented evidence of a vinegar-based drink like this comes from uh, Iran. And so the word shrub doesn't have anything to do with the bush. How that word shrub moved over to English is unclear to me, but interesting, fun shrub fact. And that made me think that if you were to make this drink from a small version of an autumn olive, you could be enjoying a sub shrub shrub. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Michael Baker. Michael is a professional foraging educator in the Chicago area and host of the Wild Edible World podcast. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Speaking of podcasts, this is a podcast, and if you like it, you can find out ways to help the show at rootboundpodcast.com slash support. Rootbound is hosted by Droop Guy, Steve Ellington. Music by Christian Krikoskota. Fake ads by David Lonnie. Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, but if you can go outside, enjoy a shrub, the plant or the drink, or both. Gorms!